but the support that the DeSantis gave to the school, and I'll come back to that um, later. Uh, the headmaster at the time of the First World War was uh, Mr. Walter Sawtell, and his deputy was uh, Mr. Gotch. Uh, well, uh, senior master was really the term in those days, and the senior mistress was a Miss Simons, and in addition there were six permanent staff and six part-time. It was such a small school that the art master, for example, shared his time with Uxbridge County School and Southall County School. Mm -hmm half a week at um, each. Uh, for the purposes of sport and games, the pupils were divided into three houses called school, town and country. Now that worked all right to begin with. If you lived near the school, you were in schoolhouse. If you lived in Uxbridge, you were in townhouse. If you lived anywhere else, you were in county, country house. Sorry. Well, as time went by, uh, <coughs> country house became a bit large um, and, and so of course they, they, they uh, had to adjust it slightly but nevertheless those names remain until the school moved up here in 1928. When war broke out there was an old pupils association already, it had been founded in 1909, the school was only opened in 1907 so the first old Amsonians were all teenagers. <laughs> Their first reunion they played charades. Uh, and, and of course the name Old Uxonians had not then appeared. That was uh, something that uh, came after the war in the 1920s. But there was an Old Pupils Association. There was a sense of belonging to a community. It was, a, it was such a small group of people. It was a sort of family. And I think that is revealed not only in the ethos that, that one learns from the records, but also um, in the way that they conducted themselves. They, they feel that they really belong to an organisation. My talk about the First World War is largely based on the complete set of school magazines that we have. And we, we do have a remarkable collection of archives, of course. Uh, generally speaking, three issues of the magazine came out e each year. Well now, First World War, uh, war was declared on the 4th of August 1914 and by that time the German army had already invaded Belgium. And so it wasn't long before refugees arrived in this area. Uh, it is believed about a hundred altogether uh, settled in the Uxbridge area. And some of them were very close to the school because further down the road was St Peter's Church. Um, uh, and uh, it's still there although it's now a community centre. But that was opened for the Belgian refugees, it's right near the school. Mm. Um, and um, I, I discovered that the pupils started collecting funds for these refugees and uh, uh, they, by, by uh, the end of the year they had raised £7.14 and £5. <laughs> <laughs> and actually there were two Belgian brothers from Bruges whose names appear in our admissions register. They weren't at the school for long but nevertheless they did appear briefly. In the first months of uh, the war, we know that 867 men volunteered and signed on at Uxbridge, the recruiting centre. And by December, the school magazine reported that of the 120 boys that had passed through our school, 30 had joined the forces. One of them, Stanley Chipperfield, who had joined the Royal Army Medical Corps, wrote this and sent it to the school magazine. So long as we can play the game, so long as we can bring just a little honour to our school, so long as we do nothing to sully the fair name of the school we love, and hand on the glorious tradition she taught us, what matters anything? <laughs> That's what I mean by the ethos of the, of the uh, era. Before the war, Rachel de Salis had composed a school song and one verse now seemed very poignant. Our fathers served old England and we will serve her too. We'll work for her, we'll fight for her, and to her cause be true. By the end of 1914, two teachers had left the school that they resigned to join the army. One was Sergeant Instructor Harry Smith from the Territorials. Now in those days there was no gymnasium, but there were usual sports and field games, 
but what we might call as an ordinary lesson was in fact drill. The pupils went out, boys and girls, and just lined up and walked up, marched up and down like soldiers. And Sergeant Instructor Smith came in part time to carry out that. Well, he left to join the regular army and indeed the Middlesex Regiment and eventually rose to the rank of captain. Another teacher who resigned taught French, a Mr Norman Bottomley. He left to join the army although he later transferred to the Air Force and he remained in the Air Force after the war and had a brilliant career. He was finally Air Chief Marshal Sir Norman Bottomley, KCB. <laughs> and it's sobering to think that but for the war, he might have been an ordinary humdrum teacher in a school in Uxbridge. <laughs> Early in 1915, Miss Benson, the girls' games teacher, also left to become a nurse with the Red Cross unit at Bedford. And by the, uh, uh, the beginning of 1915, 34 old boys had enlisted although three had been invalided out. At this period, a branch of the Girls' Patriotic Union was formed in the school, its main aim being to knit items of clothing. And in March, the magazine recorded that helmets, socks, mittens and mufflers had been completed and that a concert in aid of the Wool Fund had raised seven pounds. <laughs> and this knitting activity continued uh, for the rest of the war. May 1915 brought the news of the first death. Private Albert Plummer, who had been one of the founder members uh, of the school in 1907, died in the fighting around Ypres, serving with the Middlesex Regiment. One of his brothers, who didn't come here, had also been killed by that uh, stage in France. But by now, 66 old boys were in the forces and many wrote to the headmaster describing their experiences <coughs> and extracts were read to the pupils in assembly and some of these are quite harrowing there's one recorded in the magazine of Henry Brown who apparently in one of the charges amid deafening noise and bursting shells suddenly felt a sharp sting under the knee and found that a bullet had travelled down his leg and out at the ankle after tying up his leg and dressing the wounds himself with iodine on cotton provided in the soldier's field dressing kit, he was gassed and lay among the dead and wounded for many hours, his comrades having gone. Under cover of night, he crawled on his hands and one knee, dragging his wounded leg for about four miles to a dressing station. It was reported that by the time the magazine appeared that he'd had an operation at the hospital in Netley and that he was making a good recovery. In the summer, the school lost another teacher when Mr Lister, who taught mathematics, became attached to the Royal Navy, uh, teaching mathematics and navigation to recruits at Greenwich. And the school uh, uh, collected some money to buy him a ceremonial sword. In the summer holidays of 1915, pupils were asked to collect a plant called yarrow, a herb to be used in medicines. And altogether, by the end of the holidays, they got 70 pounds of good quality yarrow, collected, dried and parceled up. For this, the school received one pound nine and tuppence, but they decided to donate that sum to Barnardo's homes. The threat of Zeppelin raids was now looming, and the school was sent advice. There were, of course, no air raid shelters. And they were told, if they were in the classroom, to crouch under their desks, or, if not, hold a pastry board or drawing board over their heads <laughs> and stand around the edge of the playing field. <laughs> Miss Simons later commented, it was just as well as these schemes were not tested. <laughs> there were no Zeppelin raids in this area. Uh, uh, during the war, or there were rumours that Zeppelins had been seen. <laughs> By the end of 1915, two old boys had been killed, two more, uh, one of them being Lieutenant Jerome Fain de Salis, oh, the son of Cecil and Rachel. He was wounded <laughs> near Ypres, brought back to this country, but died in a military hospital. His brother George, who didn't come to our school, had also been killed by that time. 
But a, a footnote to this, because after the war it was decided that a new church would be needed at Dawley, near where the de Salis family lived. They had the Dawley Court estate. So the, the, they, the family gave a plot of land on their estate and also a sum of money and um, St. Jerome's Church was built. I was confirmed there. Really? I was on the Right. Gosh. Um, Jerome, was it an accident I wonder? You know, this yeah. was the name of their son who had been killed uh, in the war. Um, is it too much to think we have a church named after an old Axonian? <laughs> 1915 also saw the arrival on the staff of Miss Cecilia Hill, a cultured lady who did much for English and drama, both in the school and for the old Axonians, and of course later encouraged the young Bernard Myers. At Christmas the pupils sent four footballs to the Middlesex Regiment. By now old boys in uniform were frequent visitors to the school, some on leave, some convalescent. Rifle shooting had been one of the activities for boys for some time before the war at a rifle range in Uxbridge. And by the way, Mr. De Salis uh, paid for all their ammunition out of his own pocket. But now there was talk of creating a school cadet corps. And by the autumn of 1916, it had been formed and they were awaiting uniforms. Fundraising about that time consisted of concert in aid of the Lord Roberts Fund for Disabled Soldiers and Sailors and five pounds was raised. In October 1916 there was a campaign in the district to raise money for the Red Cross and this included a round the town procession. So our school decided to take part and since the event took, part, uh, took place on Trafalgar Day they decided to put on a display of, with Nor Lord Nelson and four sailors. So a boy was dressed up as Lord Nelson and four others as sailors of the period. On a hired lorry uh, they took part in the procession round the town. Reeds and decorations were added to our float in the school colours red and green. The whole event was deemed to be a great success. On the outbreak of war, the Hillingdon House estate, on the other side of the main road, was on the market. The Cox family, bankers, were uh, selling their estate and also, incidentally, at the same time, Harefield Place estate, which they also owned. But it remained unsold until 1916, when the government stepped in to acquire the estate, and initially it then became a convalescent home for Canadian soldiers. <coughs> One of these men actually came to the school and spoke to the upper forms about his life in Canada. But in January 1917, the government tried to raise funds for the war effort by issuing 3.5% war stock. And we believe that old pupils bought some because your association still has an income every year from war stock. <laughs> Unfortunately, the original paperwork and the certificate has been lost, so we're not totally sure, but, but we think that the old pupils of that period bought some stock, and if you look at our accounts, and do come to the AGN, um, <laughs> if you look at the accounts, you'll find, we're, as usual, we received £10 <laughs> this year from this First World War stock. It became clear that the success of German U-boats was threatening our country's food supplies. And so, at the end of 1917, a nationwide campaign was launched to grow more food and to provide allotments up and down the land. A piece of land in the Greenway at the junction with King's Road, not far from the school, became available, so our school took three plots and in the ensuing period grew, I think, mostly potatoes. Um, it, it seems that by the end of the war they had grown 70 tonnes of potatoes, <laughs> uh, which had been sold, uh, but they gave the money to St Dunstan's, the, the uh, charity for the blind. By March 1917, the Cadet Corps was in uniform and became known officially as the 8th Company of the 2nd Battalion of the Middlesex Regiment. The headmaster, Mr. Sortell, now became Captain Sortell in charge, in command, and his deputy, Mr. Gotch, was now Lieutenant Gotch. Drills and parades were held regularly. 
The fourth form at the school raised money to provide the company with a bugle, while the lower fifth donated Morse signalling uh, flags. In the summer holidays, 32 boys went off to a camp at Aldermaston, uh, where they were among 1,500 cadets from all over the country camped in tents. In July, the school prepared a food economy <coughs> exhibition organised by the cookery teacher, Mrs Coward. And in the two days it was open, over 300 people attended from various parts of the district. Miss Mary Voigt, a daughter of a local vicar, prepared a meal containing, quote, neither meat nor wheat. And a year later, Miss Voigt became the school's cookery teacher. And as some of you remember, Polly, as she was known, remained until her retirement in 1952. The school magazine was being sent to old pupils serving in the forces, and their replies make interesting reading. Second Lieutenant Reginald Bree, a pilot in the Royal Air Force, wrote, I have seen six German aircraft brought down, five in thrilling air fights, and one by an anti-aircraft shell. I was awfully pleased to see that Schoolhouse tied for first place on sports day. <laughs> <coughs> Bree's career is worth mentioning, I think. Shortly before the end of the war, he was actually taken prisoner. I don't know the circumstances. But of course it wasn't long before the war ended and he came out of the services. He joined the Sierra Autogyro Company at Heston as their pilot and was therefore the first man in the country to fly autogyros. Uh, later on, uh, he, he stayed on uh, with the firm and in, at the Old Axonians reunion in June 1931, he actually came over in his autogyro and landed on the playing field outside, which of course at the time would have been a sensational event. And uh, I, for over the years, uh, people have come to me, I was there when the autogyro came down, you know. It, it was really uh, something. Bree went on to fly helicopters, indeed he became the first man in this country to get a licence to fly helicopters, and then towards the end of his career he became a consultant with Westlands down in uh, Yeovil. I'm trying to get our council to place a blue plaque on the house in the Greenway where he lived as a schoolboy, but we do give an annual prize at this school uh, in memory of Reginald Bree. Another ex-pupil wrote from the battlefield, will you try and impress on Country House that they must pull themselves together? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all a sort of Harry Potter issue. <laughs> you, you know, there's all sorts of magic and wizardry, but in the end, what ma matters is really how po many points Gryffindor have got. <laughs> <laughs> sort of thing. But uh, there we are. By now, 18 old boys had been killed and Mrs. de Salis had made a temporary role of honour to place in the school hall. Late in 1917, the Canadian troops left Hillingdon House since the authorities had decided that the estate should become the armament and gunnery school of the Royal Flying Corps. <coughs> so in late 1917, early 1918, immense activity took place as the military moved in. Unfortunately, some of the uh, firing ranges were quite close to the main road and the school. <laughs> and uh, there were occasions when teachers found it almost impossible to get heard over the noise of the machine gun fire from across the road. In April 1918, of course, the Flying Corps became the RAF and in May, King George V visited the station and uh, uh, some of the pupils went out to watch him arrive. In March 1918, the magazine contained the news that 50 pairs of socks had been sent to the Middlesex Regiment in the past years. In the summer, the school advertised a wartime food exhibition displaying jams, preserves and wartime recipes. And in the holidays, parties of boys went to work at a farm in Cowley, while Miss Simons took a party of girls to Ochterade in Scotland to pick raspberries. <laughs> and I've put out photographs in room three of uh, those events. But I'm interested to see that although they were on farm work, they were still wearing school uniform. <laughs> and one wonders just how much, you know, we're used to having lots of clothes nowadays. <laughs> it may not have been true in the past. It seems so, anyway. 
In September 1918, a temporary appointment was made of a mathematics teacher, a Miss Agnes Black, <laughs> MABSC. The temporary appointment. Well, it soon became permanent, and uh, she, of course, became senior mistress and retired eventually in 1956. And so we come to the events of November the 11th, 1918, and I thought I'd just read straight out of the magazine uh, what was written. It may be of interest to future generations in school to have it recorded in the magazine how we received the tidings. Of course, we all thought that Germany had no choice but to accept the terms of surrender dictated by the Allies, however severe they might be. But taught by four long years of hope deferred and rumour contradicted, we were determined not to take things for granted. Eleven o'clock passed, and there seemed nothing in the day to mark it out as the greatest in British history. We began the last period of morning school. The machine guns over the road had ceased. Was it an omen? Through the strange stillness came the solemn boom of a distant gun. And then again, boom, boom. An excited passerby looked in to say that we, he had it from the lips of an officer. But we went on with our work. We too had once heard from lips no less voracious that Russians were passing through the country. The distant guns still spoke. And yet another wayfarer insisted on giving us absolutely authentic second-hand rumour. <laughs> we were not even grateful. At noon, the local hooters of the district blew their accustomed call for dinner. But what was this? One hooter after another began a second blast. Was it a fire? No. There were no notes of alarm or warning, but a joyful chorus of short, excited toots and long ecstatic hoots. <laughs> we knew then, but to make absolutely sure, a boy on a bicycle was sent down to the town to find out the official news. <laughs> a few minutes later, he came back. With the news, hostilities ceased at 11am French time. French time? That's ahead of Greenwich. And Greenwich then was 12.15. So the Union Jack was run up, our usual signal of a red letter day, but never had it signalled such a day. The passing carts and lorries were aflutter with flags. We were strangely quiet and unexcited. After 50 months of anxiety and strain, it took more than a few minutes to realise what the signing of the armistice meant. The last tremendous battle was over. The weary watches were past. Our incomparable navy and army with those of our allies had done their job and won undying fame in the doing. In our own small sphere, the thought sprang uppermost that the last name had been added to our long, terrible and splendid roll of honour. After dinner, we assembled in hall, where the headmaster impressed upon us the greatness and solemnity of the occasion, and we joined in the short service of thanksgiving. Afternoon school was out of the question, and we went home, still vainly trying to realise the immensity of the event. In 1919, a committee was set up to consider a permanent war memorial. Governors, teaching staff, pupils and former pupils were all represented. An appeal was launched and well over £100 was soon raised. The memorial was designed by Mr Watson, the art teacher, and the task of carrying out the work on the oak panel was given to a local carver and sculptor called John Broyce. The design, and of course it's still outside here, incorporates not poppies, but rosebuds as a symbol of lives that were cut short and never fully reached fruition. That memorial was unveiled in December 1922 in the presence of members of the family of those who had lost their lives. And that, gen gen gentlemen and ladies, is uh, a summary of the school at war. Yeah.